Welcome to Embargoed, intelligent talk about sanctions, export controls, and all things international trades for trade lawyers and normal human beings alike. I'm one of your hosts, Tim O'Toole, and with me today is my friend, colleague, and co-host, Scott Garrity. Scott is the president of the Export Compliance Training Institute. Welcome, Scott. We're really glad to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm glad to be here. Um, so today, because you are the president of ECTI, I thought we would talk about export controls. We would use this this forum to um, talk mostly about the ITAR. I thought we would have an ITAR chat. Um, there's been some talk about November or December being ITAR month. We're still trying to figure out which one that's going to be. And so to celebrate, um, I thought we would kind of walk through kind of a grab bag of questions or topics about the ITAR that come up a lot um, in your trainings and, uh, and, and in my practice and in your practice and uh, walk through some of the, the hot topics in, in ITAR practice. And what I thought would be to just throw it out on the floor first for you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, your experience with the ITAR generally, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit, we'll move into defense services. Uh, sure, I'm happy to. Uh, and thanks again, uh, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to, to join you on Embargoed. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I've been working with the ITAR. Um, I can actually still remember the first ITAR license application uh, I ever worked on uh, when I was uh, a very, very junior, very junior consultant. It was actually kind of exciting. It was a, um, a, a weird case. It was like an oil and gas company that had a problem, which was their executives kept getting kidnapped. Uh, and so they that wanted sounds, to send... That sounds like an actual problem. I think it was. It did seem... Or this is the kind of thing that does drive management commitment uh, yeah. to, to, to export <laughs> controls, right? Um, which, as we'll discuss later, is important in compliance programs. So It's it also does, one uh, of those things where like, I every email I get from a client usually is marked with an exclamation point and an urgent, but this one actually seems like it would deserve an exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess they. I guess they thought so, right? So, um, and they. So, what was the? What were they doing? That they needed to send some um, some armored vehicles abroad uh, to protect their executives. And uh, you know, armored vehicles not necessarily ITAR controlled even then, right? This, this is twenty five years right. ago. But they put um, something in the vehicles. The vehicles. It was like James Bond kind of stuff, right? Like they could shoot tacks out the back, and the door handles were electrified. The, the exterior door handles. Um, and it also could shoot um, uh, tear gas out, and that was on the munitions list back then. It no longer, no longer generally is, and so they had to get a license because of the the tear gas. So that was my first experience with the ITAR uh, back in like 1998 or so. That's actually great. I mean, your first experience is like a tear gas kidnapping story. So, you know, my I think my first experience with the ITAR was doing a registration for somebody. And so it's not nearly as fun, but I'm sure I could turn it into a fun story. But, you know, tear gas, I'm yeah. not going to talk tear gas and, and kidnapping. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so, yeah. So since then, you know, the... Uh, Work with you know I'm I'm president of ECTI. ECTI does training all over the world on export controls, including the ITAR, right? And so uh, you know been helping people try to understand and grapple with the ITAR since then, uh, and uh, also you know doing it as a as a practitioner, as a consultant, helping people understand it, get approvals, cope with it, manage it within their organization. So I guess the th the thing that main thing that struck me about the ITAR at the beginning was just how much the regs didn't tell you. Uh, and, uh, you know, some people look at it and they say, Hey, the regs are short, right? They're sh relative, right? Relative way shorter than the EAR. So <laughs> yes. let's just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mostly compared to the other things that, that I'm looking at, right. Which the EAR, maybe some of the sanctions regulations, right. Where there's 30 odd sets of different regs, but the ITAR is relative, was relatively short, still is relatively short. It's a little longer than it used to be. Um, but I also found that, you know, it's short, but also there's not a lot of answers to all of my questions in here. Uh, and so then trying to fill in those gaps uh, has been a lot of the challenge. And that's how I've, I've learned about it, hearing from other people, like when they ask me questions and trying to help them understand it has been largely the path to me um, trying to understand it, understand it better. Yeah, and ECTI is an organization that I sometimes train with as well. And, and it's a great organization. Um, and, you know, it gives us some insight on what 
people are these trainings, you know, which take place all around the country and now all around the world, at least for me, give me some insight on kind of what people are thinking about, what some of the hot topics are, because we kind of get out all over the country and really talk to mm-hmm. defense contractors who are doing this practice. You know, and in terms of the ITAR, just for, you know, our listeners who may be the the normal human beings, not the, the trade nerds. So the International Trafficking in Arms Regulations uh, really focuses on three types of things. There's defense articles, defense services, and technical data. And, um, you know, just to kind of put it into a big bucket like that. And one of the topics that comes up a lot when um, I'm talking to folks, and then it's actually come up in the, the news quite a bit, is you've got U.S. persons, who, often former military persons, who want to go do trainings abroad um, and kind of, you know, work with foreign governments and feel like, you know, this is kind of how they can monetize their their expertise in the military field. Can you talk a little bit about both kind of generally how the ITAR regulates defense services and some of the dangers that um, people can run into when they're doing this? Yeah, uh, definitely. So, you know, when people think about export controls, to the extent people think about export controls, right, they're often focused on um, goods, right, and maybe technology also, yep. right? And definitely ITAR applies to those things. Uh, but it also has this concept of defense services, which is providing different kinds of assistance. Uh, and there's a definition of it, like some other definitions in this area. It's maybe a little vague, right? Um, but a defense service is where somebody provides um, assistance that's either technical in nature, so help somebody engineer something, design something, manufacture something, make something. But it could also just be like maintain something. So somebody going out to turn a wrench on, say, a military aircraft or a radar system, just to give a couple examples, could be considered a service uh, that needs approval, even if they're not really exporting any know-how or exporting any, let alone any goods, right? It can also be military training. Um, and this could encompass a lot of things, right? I worked with this one company that would, um, they sold parachutes, but they also trained people on how to use them. And so uh, if you train people on uh, kind of a military specific jump, maybe that's high altitude, low opening, think, you know, stuff that you see Tom Cruise do in Mission Impossible. Maybe that is military training, uh, although sometimes understanding what is military training and what's not military training can be part of the challenge. But generally, if you provide these services that meet this definition and you know, you're know you a US person, you're a, you're a US company, uh, you need to get approval to provide these services even when you're not really exporting any kinds of goods or technology. And a lot of, you know, companies, businesses, especially defense contractors, they understand that, right? And they get approval for that all the time. But there's also a lot of individuals wandering the earth. The thing that Americans is there's a lot of us, right? There's hundreds <laughs> yep. of millions of us. Well, and we have a we have a pretty big military too. So there's a lot of Americans right. with former military service. Right. You've got all the you've got a lot of those people who then, you know, once they get their 20 years in or, or sooner, right, they might go out and, and try to do different kinds of work where they're working for US companies, they're working for non US companies, they're working directly for foreign governments, um, where they may be providing defense services, uh, and they need approval generally to do that wherever they are in the world. Uh, and you also have a lot of people who are, you know, we think of people who are, you know, maybe ex US military, and that's definitely a piece of this. But this also applies to US persons wherever they are in the world, even yeah. if they're dual citizens. And so you've got a lot of people, there's a lot of dual citizens out there. Uh, and you've got a lot of people who are US citizens, and something else, and they might not even think of themselves really, and other people might not know or per- certainly perceive them as US citizens. And this applies to them, too. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that is quite a topic of confusion because, you know, the export control rules generally deplo- uh, apply a definition of U.S. persons that is broader than I think the person on the street would think of. I think, you know, when you are a green card holder, but you're a citizen of another country, you often would not think of yourself as a U.S. person, but as a legal matter, you are, which causes a lot of confusion. And then we'll talk a little bit later about some of the confusion that's, you know, even you know, more 
technical in terms of the definition of U.S. persons in the deemed export context. But here, I mean, I think that the confusion was enough that in January of 2023, DDTC came out with some FAQs that were just geared towards U.S. person and defense, U.S. persons and defense services and the confusion there. Part of that is the definition of U.S. persons. I think part of it is also that, you know, as you mentioned, Scott, export controls laws, you know, usually apply to stuff. Right. So in the in the EAR context with with non-military or dual use items, you, you've, you're you're really not regulating services for the most part. And, you know, in the in the ITAR context, defense articles. So like your ground vehicle discussion, your armored vehicle discussion um, is one where people you know, if they're thinking about the ITAR, which again, query how often that happens. But if you're thinking about the ITAR, you're probably thinking about defense articles. You're not thinking about services. And so DDTC put out some guidance in January of 2023. I think it was in conjunction with a couple of high profile enforcement actions that have come out in the last two years as well, where U.S. persons got into quite a bit of trouble for them providing defense services or at least allegedly providing defense services abroad you want to talk a little bit about that that you know in in any order you like yeah yeah it does seem like the regulator right the director of defense trade controls is a little bit more focused on this uh this issue than they were in the past and they've put out a couple rounds of, of guidance right that they've developed over i think over the last three years or so because i remember going to visit a company for whom this was a very live issue. And at the time it was kind of like, well, you know, I think this is what the regs mean and how it would apply, but they really don't talk about it and there's no guidance um, on it, but there's been, you know, more since then. Um, and you've seen the Justice Department get seemingly more interested in this than they have been in the past. Now they're, they seem to be mostly focused on the, the angle on people who are U.S. citizens, I mean, from the cases that I've seen, right? Yep. So they're, they're U.S. citizens, have clear, strong ties to the U.S., and specifically cases where you've got X U.S. military, X um, intelligence community employees, where it's not just your, you know, your average person on the street, right, who might be doing something that could be a defense service. These are people where... <sighs> Maybe the regulations are the same for everybody, right? One would hope, but they are. Um, there's a higher standard, right, for these people, and more attention to what they're doing and the assistance they can provide. So, like, there's one case. Literally, there's a guy sitting in in an Australian jail cell right now um, who has been accused of by the U.S. government, right, accused of having um, provided training to Chinese military pilots, uh, at least partly in South Africa. Uh, for an outfit there and helping them. He's a former Marine Corps pilot, so some experience landing uh, on ships. So a particular military skill there uh, and training them on how to do that without getting authorization, right? So he is, he's a US person, presumably, um, and he's providing this sort of assistance that could be construed as military training and therefore, uh, therefore a defense service. So that's, that's one case. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, that case I found very interesting I, I, in part for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, first off, um, it does seem like a big part of the concern there from the U.S. perspective was not only were these, this guy former military, but the, at least the allegation is that he was training Chinese fighter pilots. And so, you know, providing defense services to the Chinese military is probably, you know, in the top three, if not number one on the list of things that are going to get the attention of DDTC. The other thing, uh, at least from reading the press reports, was that it sounds like this was a began as a UK investigation into this the South African training school. And my guess is that the UK investigators gave a tip to the US, which is in keeping with one of the themes that we've been talking about in connection with sanctions and in connection with the EAR, is there really is a lot of cross-border cooperation now. And you know, and you know, what you mentioned also is, you know, more evidence of that, which is he was arrested in Australia and is sitting in an Australian prison cell. Right. Right. It is hardly the first you know, time somebody has been detained at the request of the U.S. government, and then um, there have been extradition proceedings, right? Yeah. I mean, we see yeah. that we see that fairly fairly regularly. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, the one thing that's that I find it, it, it does turn out to be often a very political decision, and so you kind of see who your friends are and kind of see what countries behave like. When I've mm -hmm. dealt with extradition proceedings in the past, one of the funniest things is that the French appear to generally be willing to 
arrest on extradition, but often they will um, sometimes trade off the uh, prisoner in exchange for benefits to the French. So like I have dealt with cases where somebody was extradited for potential Iran sanctions violations and the prisoner went back to Iran in exchange for benefits to the French, although they were arrested at the American request, but they just were never sent back to the US. And so um, it just, those stories strike me as at least consistent with maybe some stereotypes about the French. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not to yeah, offend our, yeah. our friends in no. France, of course, because no, we have listeners not. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, so it, it happens, right? Um, and it often seems to be uh, a cooperative effort again, where you often have seem to have the U.S. authorities or, you know, intelligence agencies working with law enforcement, working with work Australians or, you know, there have been cases in the U.K. Certainly there have been cases in, in Singapore. There have been cases elsewhere in Europe where stuff yeah. like this, stuff like this happens. So that's one case that's that's pending right now and it does take all the boxes right so it's china it's the chinese military it's more specific than that it's a particular um aspect of chinese military operations where yeah. that's growing and is of more concern to the us and so you can see why that might be why might be prioritized right um yeah. yeah i mean there was another case uh in the uae uh which involved uh again former us military and intelligence um operatives right employees who were working for contractors ultimately working for the UAE government uh, and where I think that resulted in consent agreements with DDTC. And they basically had accused them of, again, providing unauthorized defense services. In this case, it was, this case I think is, for me, it was a little bit less clear cut whether the ITAR would apply to this um, right. sort of thing. So I think part of what they were doing was trying to set out the, a marker that they believed that the ITAR could apply to these sort of um, very specific sort of hacking software yeah. exploits. Uh, and there, there is language certainly in the USML that can be read that way, but I don't think it's super clear, uh, right. let's say, what it does cover. Um, but here you had people working for a foreign government. They were, the US government said that they were warned about it. Um, and uh, they nonetheless proceeded without authorization. Again, it was you know providing unauthorized defense services. Yeah, I, I definitely thought they were trying to put down a marker that this stuff is on the USML, and I think they had they thought this was a good case to do it because they had an ally that was these folks' former employer who was also in the UAE, and these these guys had apparently, again, you know, this is an indictment. And, Indictment is not evidence, but according to the indictment, these guys were working in the UAE for a defense contractor who was, according to DDTC, complying with the ITAR by essentially getting a license to provide these defense services. And then they decided they could make more money by going into business for themselves and not getting a license and essentially providing the same services, but without a license. And so if I had to guess, just based on the reports, my guess is that their former employer um, may well have uh, initiated this investigation uh, because they were probably not too happy that uh, their employees had gone off and probably tried to take their <laughs> take mm -hmm. their business on mm -hmm. their own and so but I, but i think the you know from a from a compliance standpoint my guess is that it was a good case because you had a company from the u.s saying that these were defense services and having gotten a license for it and then also um a good case in the sense that you you uh had one company that was kind of the hallmark of compliance because they followed all the rules and another company that wasn't and so standing them up side by side made a, a good teaching moment in terms of ITAR compliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see to see more of this, right? It does seem to be an area that they're that they're zeroing in on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of a lot of others, a lot of companies around the world are kind of looking at this wondering, um, you know, what does this mean for us if we employ, you know, I kind of half jokingly when I'm doing training outside the US, I'll often say, hey, you want to avoid ITAR problems? Don't buy anything from the United States. Don't use US technology and also don't hire Americans, right, right. Uh, to try to head off some of these problems. Uh, and it's not entirely a joke, right? You've got non US companies that are looking at this and they you know, first of all, do they do they know if they employ anybody who's a U.S. citizen or a dual citizen of the U.S. and perhaps their country? And then what's their what's their you know obligations in that scenario for what yeah. they're supposed to do when they have these U.S. persons who might be might be working for them? 
No, no, it's a big issue. I mean, as 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 you mentioned, you know, when you train overseas, I I do a little bit of training overseas as well, and also you know work with some clients overseas and ITAR free is a thing like like when you talk to clients who particularly in Europe they want to figure out a way to make sure that their project and their you know defense contracting is ITAR free because of the complexity of dealing with US export control laws but as as we both know that's easier said than done cuz you know generally the questions that I get somebody wants something to be ITAR free and the answer is yeah, no. Um, you, you you got too close to the sun, and then you're essentially stuck with the ITAR forever, which is, in some ways, you know, understandable because U.S. does not want its military technology that's on the USML getting out there. But on the other hand, um, it doesn't take much to to make something subject to the ITAR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see it. Definitely see it too. Uh, and I, when I, people say ITAR free, I mean, my next question is off, so often, you know, is it EAR free, right? Is it still, right. is it still free of, is it free of all U S controls or is it just free, just free of the ITAR? And a lot of people haven't really pondered the, pondered the next question. <laughs> right. Right. Which, you know, as, as we'll talk about at the end, uh, the fact that the EAR applies can bring in some real complexity that uh, folks, who think only about the ITAR might not not realize. So with that, um, why don't we turn to the next topic in our ITAR grab bag, which is um, the issue of when an item, and this is one you know that really comes from overseas clients and and uh, and students a lot. That is an item that is made somewhere else comes into the U.S. or um, you know, or crosses lines after it's subject to the ITAR and bought by a foreign government. So let's talk, let's take them both in turn. So there was a December 2022 proposed rule. It kind of looked at both of these two issues, you know, one about taking items on exercises and another about items not otherwise subject to the ITAR previously imported into the U.S. Why don't you talk a little bit about the proposed rule and how common this issue is? Yeah, I think this is something that people would, would think, well, this seems really, uh, why would people be concerned about some of these issues? It seems really, really extreme. But I think what happens is people get so sensitized to the ITAR and so worried about it and paranoid about it um, and worried about having their transactions and products contaminated with the ITAR, which is um, actually not a crazy worry <laughs> a lot of the right. time, um, right? Because it seems like it's so easy to do and the the rules about it or the limiting factors around it are there, there aren't a lot that are that are really written down. So people get um, very skittish around it. And so then you get questions like this, like, um, and I thought it was interesting when DDTC published this rule because I'd never really heard anybody in the US talk about it. So I thought it was interesting that DDTC at least had been thinking about it. So one was, um, you know, and this is, again, these might seem silly, right? Or, or kind of crazy that everybody would think this, but what if I'm, what if I'm a, a non-US government and I've got ITAR controlled equipment, right? Because I've bought it uh, and I own it, right? And I'm a sovereign government and I want to, you know, deploy my forces to another country. So am I applying for a license from the US government when I want to fly my jets to another country or march my, march my, my army <laughs> across a border? And people would probably think, well, that's crazy. Of course they don't, right? They, they do what they need to do. Um, and that's basically the answer is no, they're not applying for licenses. Governments, right, uh, are right. not applying for licenses in that sort of situation. But nothing in the ITAR says that that's not regulated, right? That would meet the definition of re-export if you go to another country. So that would seem to indicate that they need approval, but they're not getting it. And DDTC has published a little bit of guidance on this, on this in the past saying, if you're deploying your forces, if you are, or what's actually more common are military exercises, right? Where you're going to another country, another region of the world um, and taking that equipment with you. So what they've proposed now is to make that explicit in the regulations, right? In the same section that says things like launching stuff into space isn't considered to be an export, they would add a provision saying that if it's a government and you're deploying forces, ITAR equipment, or going on exercises, we're not going to consider that to be regulated. So that's, I think that's um, important to, you know, make that clear and actually put it, let's put it in the regs. I think that's the right way to do it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I do too. And I, I, you've probably had this experience too. Dealing with foreign governments and dealing with the ITAR is kind of 
at least in some circumstances, kind of funny. I, I've actually seen, and I think it's end user certificates, but these statements that are signed by the UK government where they'll, uh, they'll sign something, but then they'll say, but we're not admitting that we're subject to the ITAR, like in the right. statement right. itself. And so, so it's, it is one of these things where even where you have, you know, foreign government compliance, they're saying, I, I'm not complying. I'm just signing this. Right. Um, so, right. I think so, the real enforcement mechanism in that case is, you know, if you're not going to use things ultimately for a permissible end use right or activity, you know, the U.S. might say, OK, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to approve any more sales. Right. Or you're not going to get exactly. spare parts or so that's exactly. the real mechanism with governments. Uh, I think um, it's a different story with with businesses. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. But it's yeah. like no more sales for you is really the enforcement mechanism. But I think that, you know, from a diplomatic standpoint, the U.S. really doesn't want to go there for ITAR compliance issues. So this, you know, the 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 exercises rule was, I think, just a reflection of reality where it's like we're not going to enforce this because it just seems like something that ought to be allowed. But we're also, you know, not going to license it because it's not going to be easy enough to license. So let's just write it out of the ITAR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they, they're doing something there in that same proposal, right? They would do something similar with what if I have something, not everything in the world is subject to the ITAR, right? So what if I make something in Europe, it's a hundred percent European, not using any U S technology, right? But it's something that is described on the ITAR's control list on the munitions list. And then yeah. I send it to the U S maybe I send it for a trade show or to demonstrate for somebody. So people would wonder and ask, Hey, so if I send it to the U S does it, and then it, you know, it's just temporary. So it comes out of the U.S. eventually back to me. And does that mean that it's always subject to the ITAR because it had a vacation, it had yeah. vacation in the U.S.? <laughs> and sort of logically, hey, you know, it needs approval because the ITAR also regulates things that temporary imports into the U.S., regardless of the origin of the item. So it needs approval to come into the U.S. and then go back out. But once it's out, um, unless it's been like improved or modified or enhanced or upgraded in the U.S., it seems like, okay, that wouldn't be subject to the ITAR, but they would make that explicit in this proposal too. So yeah. I, think that, I think that's a worthwhile clarification. I 100% agree. I mean, actually at the, the training we just did in, in Phoenix, we had that question come up and at least hmm. currently until the rules changed, it's arguable that that item is subject to the ITAR while it comes into the United States. Once the rules changed and clarified, I think that that becomes much a much easier question. But right now those questions are still coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it. Either of those as kind of a big deal. Um, but I think it's, you know, this stuff should, a lot of this stuff should, I think should go, I'm a big fan of the regs, right? So it should go, it should go into the regs, right? Rather than relying upon word of mouth, the occasional FAQ, something you saw on somebody's PowerPoint deck three years ago yeah. at some event, you know. That is one of my like favorite things about export controls is that, is that, you know, People talk about something that somebody said at a conference like it's law. It's like, no, that's something somebody said at a conference. Um, it, it really does seem to be an area where that is m more frequently described as law, I think, in part because uh, the, the ITAR has gotten a lot better about this, and I think the EIR is pretty good about it. It's much more common with OFAC. But in terms of, in terms of you know, you don't have specific enough rules, so everybody's hungry for any scrap of information that they can get, and so they they go and listen to people at conferences, and they'll say something about something that is very unclear, and that will become kind of the common law of whatever export control subject that is. And I, I do think it's relatively unique to the export controls field. I, I don't see it in some of the other, at least white collar areas that I practice. Like a, li a little bit about that with the FCPA, I have to say, but I mm -hmm. think export controls is a little bit, it is, is very, it, people, people write down and repeat like gospel things that somebody said at a conference three years ago and often it's <laughs> kind of an offhand aside. <laughs> right, right. They're hungry, hungry for more. I think. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Right? Especially in the case of the ITAR, where there's there is there do seem to be a lot of concepts that aren't written down or are rather vague. Yeah, I, it's definitely true, and it to to it's a good segue into a concept that is kind of vague and unusual and unique to the U.S. But I think is if I had to rank kind of the the issue that is 
comes up the most nowadays and for all sorts of different businesses, I would point to the deemed export rule, not, it, which is obviously not just a rule in the ITAR context. It's, it's also a rule in the EAR context, but it's become very, um, a very hot topic in the ITAR context because of the, the, the lawsuit the DOJ brought against SpaceX in connection with the deemed export rules and the definition of US persons. Um, and so it, it has kind of presented what has been a kind of a simmering issue, uh, particularly among our European friends, because the deemed export rule, as, as we know, looks to the nationality of, of a, a person who receives controlled information and deems that to that transfer of controlled information to that person as an export to that person's home country. And so it, it does look specifically at someone's nationality in determining whether or not um, a legal violation has taken place. And this concept, you know, it, in Europe, they've always pointed to this concept as, as an example of foreign nationality discrimination. And the SpaceX mm -hmm. lawsuit um, that, that was brought, uh, the, the DOJ lawsuit against SpaceX, kind of takes this on explicitly in, in conjunction with some guidance that DOJ has put out with respect to when you can take nationality into account for compliance with the export controls rules. Why don't you talk a little bit about the, the confusion created by the deemed export rules and it kind of this, this, this kind of battle in some sense between export controls compliance and you know, the anti-discrimination rules that prevent discrimination based on foreign national, nationality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the deemed export rule is, it's conceptually kind of simple, but it's also counterintuitive. Right. So, you know, fundamentally to say if you release technology or in some cases software uh, to a foreign person in the United States to begin with. Right. That's considered to be considered to be an export, which under the ITAR would normally mean you need a license. Right. Uh, and under the EAR, well, like everything under the EAR, it depends a lot on the details of what the technology and software source code is and what the person's nationality is. Um, so that's sort of simple, but it's also not what people think when they think of, of exports, right? They think of sending something out of the country to begin with. And this rule means that you can make an export without sending something out of the country, right? Um, and it happens a lot in the context of employment. So the, the, the basic problem you know, people have with this in the US is they have to simultaneously comply with export control requirements and not engage in prohibited, prohibited discrimination, um, right? And so DOJ, there have been a, num a number of cases like this um, over the years where uh, people, uh, businesses in the US have been accused of sort of falling down on one side of that. It's usually the ones that I can recall, it's usually been where they've said things or they've uh, indicated that jobs are for US citizens only. Yep. Uh, and that's US citizens are most US persons are US citizens, but US persons, which is the, the language that's actually used also includes green card holders. It includes uh, people who've been granted asylum or granted refugee status uh, in the US. And so if you just say, you know, US citizens only, well, you're excluding those other people who are um, perhaps eligible for employment, but are, but are not US citizens. Yeah, and I think that that has that was the source of confusion in SpaceX. I mean, I will, I, I will say, you know, the other thing that I, place that I see this come up is where, you essentially have a business that does things that are regulated by the ITAR, but your entire business is not focused on doing things that are regulated by the ITAR. And so, you know, one easy way to comply with the export controls laws would be to restrict, you know, jobs to U.S. citizens or to restrict them even to U.S. persons when, in fact, those particular positions have no deemed export risk. And so that's the other thing that, you know, is really coming into play here, at least that I see kind of trying to put together compliance programs is, you know, how do you, on the one hand, make sure that you comply with the HR laws or to the, the anti-discrimination laws by, by, you know, limiting export compliance to where it's reasonably, you know, where there, there is some risk. And, and on the other hand, you know, uh, you know, how do you make sure that you, you know, the best rule to comply with the export control laws would be to just restrict jobs to U.S. citizens. It would, it would eliminate all risk. But on the other hand, if you did that, you'd have real problems under the anti-discrimination laws because there's lots of jobs that don't need to be restricted to 
U.S. citizens or even U.S. persons. Yeah, and I was surprised to see this um, this recent case with SpaceX, right? Uh, in particular, because I can remember um, using SpaceX as an example in, in training. Because I, I saw, I remember seeing once they had a job posting for a barista, right? So someone to make to make coffee. Um, that's not really an Italian word, is it? That's just something that like Starbucks it's made up a, or something. Exactly. It's like the, um, all of those different sizes. Did they still use those? They, they used to like ventia, like. All then, sizes, I think there was yeah. even a Trenti. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just a fancy way of saying big gulp, uh, exactly. I think. But uh, anyway, they, yeah, SpaceX had a job posting, I remember seeing online for a barista, and it said in there that they needed to be, you know, a U.S. citizen, U.S. permanent resident, or otherwise eligible under the ITAR. So, one, it was interesting because why would you do that for a barista? What, how on earth could a barista possibly have exposure to controlled technology, right? They clearly are not going to need it to do their job. So it must be either they put this in every job posting, right, in the entire organization, or could they actually have some exposure? Maybe, maybe the coffee stand, they have to walk by the rocket nozzle assembly, you know, area, or there's going to be a bunch of chatty engineers um, with their elbows on the counter, drinking, you know, cortados uh, and talking about stuff like that. So that was, it was interesting for that reason, but also interesting because I was surprised to see the case of SpaceX because it seemed like, as far as I could tell publicly, they were they were doing doing it the right way. But actually, the um, it's a civil case, right? So there was the the uh, DOJ. You know, one of the documents said that they had did have job postings that were problematic in terms of how they described who was eligible, and that clearly wasn't you know always always the case, right? right. Right. And I think, yeah, and I think, you know, the, the lesson from that is, is that this is something that is much more complicated because you don't just have export compliance concerns, which you, you do clearly because the deemed export rule is serious and it might be a topic for another day to talk about how frequently it's been the, um, it's been the focus of of uh, enforcement actions. Um, if you look through a lot of the consent agreements over the last few years, there's definitely a, an increased focus on deemed export issues. But on the other hand, it's a part you, you that's not your only risk as a company that is trying to comply with the export control laws because the 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 the, the issue that the Europeans have been raising frequently in this context is really coming to the fore with with DOJ, and that is. That this has any you know this has discriminatory effect if you apply it too broadly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In some ways, non-U.S. organizations have it easier actually under under the export control rules because true. they're in the ITAR and in the EAR in slightly different ways, but they write in these um, sort of carve outs from the rules uh, that in many cases allow, say, a European company to share technology with their employees who are of a third country nationality, right? So a French company with people who are Swiss or people who are French and Algerian. And um, there's something kind of similar in the EAR, whereas in, a, in the US, um, that really doesn't exist. Uh, and so this is this exists to try to smooth over some of these frictions with um, mostly with allies, right, about the U.S. trying to say, hey, you need to discriminate against people or to give them a little bit of a sop so they, in many cases, they can kind of, um, they can kind of work it out without having to go, you know, discriminate against them. Um, and so that it, that's actually become a little bit easier than it was um, before they created some of those, some of those carve outs, but they don't, they don't cover everything and, and people still struggle with them. Right. But maybe, I mean, you know, and maybe that's a good proposal for a consideration by DDTC with all respect to DDTC that they maybe they ought to start thinking about whether they can kind of there are areas that they could modify the deemed export rule within the US you know the the pure deemed export as opposed to the deemed re-export rules to to take into account some of the challenges that US employers are going to face post SpaceX in in making sure that they comply with both the export controls laws and the U.S. anti-discrimination laws. It is interesting that there's there's that exemption in the ITAR for that can be used by non-U.S. entities. Say, you know, that could even apply to like, you know, a German company that employs, um, you know, a Pakistani, you know, uh, uh, engineer. But in the same situation with the same nationalities and the same technology in the U.S., there would 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 not be an exemption that would allow that. That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Is that mm -hmm. you know, if you've got an exemption for foreign companies, why why can't you have an exemption for U.S. companies that could essentially dem 
take advantage of their own vetting of the foreign national employees to get an exemption as opposed to essentially saying that you can't hire. That might be a good way to balance the 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 you know the 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 reason behind the the deemed export rule, which is the worry that you know you make it too easy for someone to get controlled information who's not necessarily a U.S. person, um, with the 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 real discriminatory aspects of kind of looking at someone's nationality and deciding what they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So with that, I think we're going to try and um, revive something that that Brian and I used to do, but we haven't done for a while. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to the lightning round. We're going to pause here for Matt to insert when we when they um, produce this the lightning round sound effect. All right, so we've got we'll run through the last few ITAR questions in our in our other topic more quickly because it is the lightning round, but obviously we want to give enough time to each of these topics. So let's start with the ITAR Part 120 rewrite. So another topic of interest to I, I think mostly to ITAR nerds at this point, but but is that. It used to be that all of the definitions within the ITAR were just scattered throughout. Why don't you talk a little bit about the ITAR Part 120 rewrite and any thoughts that you've got on it? Yeah. So first, I'll try to take offense that you said this is only of interest to ITAR nerds. Um, uh, so you know, the ITAR has no, no um, offense intended, Scott. Uh, so. Uh, if I'm offended at being called an ITAR nerd, I, I think I'm in the wrong line of work. Uh, <laughs> the um, So, you know, the ITAR has different parts, right? And part 120 is kind of the foundation. It's mostly, it was the definitions. And DDTC has said that they're going to be working through these different parts of the ITAR, trying to clarify them, improve them. It is a very, very slow process um, from what I can tell. So maybe before I retire, they'll get to another part or two. Um, but part 120 is mostly definitions. So what did they do? Most of it's not that interesting, honestly. It was sort of reorganized. That's helpful. It's, I think it's good overall, the changes they made. But it's mostly just moving things around, reorganizing it. I think it did. One of the funny criticisms of, of this section in the past was that it was not alphabetized. The definitions were not alphabetized, which you know, it does seem sort of weird. That's usually how definitions are done. Right. They're in alphabetical order. Whereas DTC, they were just sort of on random. And not only did they not alphabetize them when they rewrote this part of the ITAR, they actually explained why they didn't alphabetize them uh, in the um, in the rule. Um, and But all that said, there were a couple interesting things they did, um, or no, more substantive things. The ones that come to my mind are, they made it clear that if you're required to be registered with the State Department under the ITAR, then you must register before you can use exemptions. Uh, and this was not completely clear before, uh, in my in my view. Um, it still actually contradicts some other texts of specific exemptions, but they did that. And probably the single most important thing was they actually codified the see-through rule for the first time. Um, the see-through rule being this concept, which has been DDCC policy for a long time, that basically if you have a part that is ITAR controlled and you integrate it into something else that would not otherwise be subject to the ITAR, uh, the, the ITAR kind of attaches to that part and continues to control that larger assembly with the integrated ITAR part, even though it might just be one part or very small proportion of the value. And that it's been their policy for a long time, but this is pretty important, and it was never actually written into the regulations. So now, so now it's in the regs. Um, so they did that, but I, I, I thought they there was kind of a, um, I think a missed opportunity here with Part 120, which is the ITAR really needs to have a section that talks more about the scope of the ITAR and what is in and what is out of the ITAR. Uh, I, and the ITAR has a little bit of the what is out in certain parts uh, of elsewhere, uh, where that talks about like information that's in the public domain, for example. Right. But it doesn't really do a good job, I don't think, of explaining always what's in um, in the ITAR, what's covered by the ITAR, which by, by which I mean not just what's on the control list, but when the ITAR applies, especially outside the United States. Right. Um, I think that they could use more on that. 
Well, and it's along the lines of the last segment where we talked about kind of things coming into the United States temporarily and then getting sent out. Does the ITAR continue to apply to those things? I think kind of go, going broader and really giving a good, more complete list of things that are in and out would be very helpful. But but it is interesting that there were some substantive additions, particularly the see-through rule in, in the reorganization of Part 120. And they did get it better than uh, the EAR in one sense, and, and that is that it, at least the definitions aren't numbered, as opposed to mm. Part 772, mm. where, where they are alphabetized, but it is basically just like, here's a, a thousand definitions, and when you're trying to actually look through and find it, you have to go to Part 772 and just scroll through to find the right place. Now, again, it's alphabetized, so you can find the word relative quickly but there's a lot of stuff to scroll through in 772 so numbering was good but alphabet alphabet alphabetization is that a word um might have been better yeah so, i think that's, that's true yeah all right so let's go to um the ddtc revised compliance program guidance which came out i think last december so almost a year ago so maybe december will have to be itar month because of that but also a couple of risk matrices that I, I think were also very helpful. Why don't you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, so uh, the ITAR is not a uh, sort of recipe book, right? It tells you um, when you need approval. It tells you what a violation is, uh, but it doesn't really tell you how to get there. And a lot of people are looking for that. We get asked questions all the time, like, you know, how do I have to encrypt my data, right? Or what kind of physical security measures do I need to have, just to name a couple? And there's really nothing in the ITAR about that. So how do they deal with that? DDTC has had compliance program guidelines, recommendations. That's all they are. I mean, technically, right. they're, they're just recommendations, right? Um, if you don't follow them, you're not committing a violation. They had them for a long time, but they were, I mean, to be fair, to be honest, an honest and fair, they were, um, <laughs> they were minimalist. Uh, they looked like they were sort of dashed off in an afternoon. Uh, they were just a few pages long. Uh, and they really needed an overhaul. And to their credit, DDTC did that. Uh, last year, and they published a much expanded version of their compliance program guidelines. Uh, so I would now definitely recommend that people who are affected by the ITAR review those. Um, I didn't see anything that was really sort of earth shattering or hugely surprising that was in there. I think it owes something to the BIS guidelines, which have for a long time been uh, more, more substantive than DDTCs. To me, I'm also seeing a hint of something maybe really only serious old timers and export controls in the ITAR will know, which is the Nun Wolfowitz Task Force report, which is 20 plus years old now, um, but probably is still, I think, the best best practices document from outside the government um, in this area as far as recommendations. So they did they did publish that. I think it. Um, it's a it's a big improvement over what they had before, and then they also um, more recently published these risk matrices, uh, which is definitely an important uh, aspect. Understanding your relative risk levels important aspect of designing you know prerequisite to really designing or improving your compliance program. And this is DDCC saying it by a number of different sort of metrics. Uh, you know, are you relatively higher or relatively lower risk? Uh, and they did also a special kind of version of this or addendum just for universities and the guidelines, their compliance program guidelines also briefly in a couple of places mention universities. So I think it's interesting that they're extending um, out a little bit beyond just thinking about businesses to uh, to universities who are also impacted, you know, specifically by the ITAR. No, I, I think that's, you know, and I, I find the risk matrices very helpful because they, you know, they'll tell you a particular type of issue, compliance issue that you might be concerned about. So, you know, deemed export or foreign persons in in, a, in the U.S. factory. And they'll tell you, if your compliance program does this, then you're low risk. If your compliance program does that, then you're medium risk. And if your compliance program basically does nothing, um, you know, you're going to be very high risk. So they kind of tell you what boxes you need to check in order to be seen as compliant. Now, you know, they don't have any effect, like you said, in terms of you, it's not a violation not to follow these, but if you do get into trouble, this is how you're going to be measured. I mean, and that's what I often tell clients mm -hmm. is like, mm -hmm. these, you, you cannot follow them. And that if you don't ever violate the ITAR, 
you will be fine. But if you do, and there's DDTC is trying to figure out what to do about the violation, they're going to look and they're going to measure you by these, you know, the, the guidelines and also look through these matrices that, for your particular issue and measure you by that. And if you don't measure up, you can be in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move on then. It wouldn't be a complete discussion of the ITAR without a discussion of export control reform, which is now 10 years old. We've had 10 years of export control reform. And um, why don't you talk a little bit about it, the successes and failures and kind of your impressions 10 years in on export control reform? Yeah, wow. This makes me really, I'm going to, I might shed a tear here, Tim. I'll try to keep it together. <laughs> um, so, you know, export control reform was this sort of uh, big effort in the first Obama administration to where everyone recognized there's some failures of U.S. export control system and policy. So let's make some changes to it. And in practice, in terms of how it actually worked out, that's mostly meant a lot of things move from being controlled under the ITAR to being controlled under the EAR. The munitions list was completely rewritten. Uh, and so it's longer now, but it controls fewer items. Uh, and the EAR, right, uh, there's far more items, military items, space-related items, eventually uh, most firearms and ammunition. I think those are the big categories of things that were largely controlled under the ITAR that moved to the EAR. Um, initially, they talked about, hey, we're going to have a single licensing agency uh, uh, where they were going to, you know, rather because we really have got three main ones. Um, BIS, DDTC, and OFAC. Uh, we're going to have one set of regs. And this is, of course, how it's done in many countries. Not all countries have really a single licensing agency, especially with sanctions. Sanctions is often right. sort of separate. Um, but in most countries, it, you know, have one export control regulator. Some have more than one. But anyway, that didn't happen. Um, so we still have different licensing agencies. And I, I always think about, there's like some old joke about you know, like heaven about Europeans, you know, Europeans love to poke fun at each other's stereotypes. Also, they actually believe the stereotypes of each other. So they'll say, you know, like that, that heaven is, you know, an Italian lover and a French cook, um, right, and a British policeman. And hell is like, you know, a German, a German policeman, you know, a British lover, uh, you know, and a Dutch cook. And it may always maybe I always wonder which one are we going to end up with if we have a single licensing agency, right? Are we going to have the the responsiveness, you know, the responsiveness of OFAC and the you know the the uh, you know the attention to detail of BIS? Or are we going to end up with the with the opposite? So it, it could have it could have gone badly if it happened, but anyway, it didn't it didn't happen um, that way. Yeah, I mean it it's it's funny because that that I, I actually don't mind the two systems. I know that, that it, you might be able to streamline, but you have the risks that you just talked about, Scott, which is, you know, you might just get one bad agency. Whereas yeah, I do think, each. exactly. I, 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 it, it, when I think about the, the breakdown of responsibility under the export controls rules, it makes some sense to me that the agency that is kind of tasked with kind of foreign policy first, the State Department, has the ITAR and the agency that is tasked with commerce first is has the rest of the the export controls because that really is kind of the balance that you want to strike is is yeah I mean we're going to control everything in some sense so so we're going to have export controls even outside of you know the military context but those export controls are really you're going to try to make them as streamlined as possible for for business and so commerce is at least theoretically, in the process of trying to make sure that companies can comply, but in the kind of most efficient way possible, whereas there's lots of instances under the ITAR where they don't really care about business and that it, because they're trying to protect people. At least that's the, the operating mm -hmm. philosophy of uh, under the under the ITAR is this is about you know, national security, it's, and if we can do some business, great, but only if it's, if we've fully vetted it and figured out national security interests. So I, I, I get that there are two different agencies because they do kind of have two different philosophies about exports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so when I think about it, I think, you know, there were some real benefits to, to export control reform. To me, the big ones were, were making the munitions list more clear. The munitions list was nobody really knew what was controlled on the munitions right. list before. It was right. so vague, especially at the level of parts and components of things. Uh, so that's really been improved. 
Uh, having more consistency in like the definitions of some of the key terms, which, you know, the definition of export in both, they're still a little different, but they were significantly different before. So that's all, that's all really, really helpful. To me, the biggest downside or the concern I have about it is um, when they went about this and changing the regulations, they did it with a, in a very deliberate and no offense, I think rather lawyerly approach. And that gives you rules to work with and language to point to and base your decisions your decisions on, but I think it did add complexity in many places, um, especially especially in the EAR, right? But right. also in the ITAR to making some of these decisions. So to me, that's the biggest downside. Yeah, I did want to, uh, and, and we'll probably finish with this. So the theory I think of underlying export control reform was that you know you save your heaviest and most complicated controls for the you know the crown jewels you basically streamline the munitions list make it clearer what's on and what's off the munitions list limit it to the things that you really want to protect and then you kind of send everything else down to the ear where it's going to be easier and, and companies can have an easier time with compliance the fact is is that um in the last you know same period the last 10 years but really mostly the last five, the EAR has gotten extraordinarily complex in for, for a variety of issues, you know, and we can talk a little bit about some of them, although I think most of this is going to probably be have, have to save, be saved for another day since we're about an hour in now and, and just took it, the, the, just getting to the complexity of the EAR. And I think we'd need at least another couple hours to talk about that. But why don't you talk a little bit about kind of what you've seen in terms of the EAR becoming more complex over the last few years so that the, the benefits of export control reform might be um, at least watered down a little bit because the EAR is no, no, simple, no, no simple set of rules to comply with. I, I, think, I think there's two main drivers of it. First of all, just simply, BIS is being asked to regulate more things, right? In fact, they're being asked to regulate almost everything except for the, the crown jewels, right? Supposedly of military that provide, you know, critical military or intelligence advantages, the language that the ITAR uses, right? And a couple other agencies that get a smidgen here and a smidgen there of other things. Otherwise, you know, they've got a tough job to do because imagine if your job was, you know, create a list and regulate the export of everything under the sun, um, but, you know, do it in a way um, where it has the, the fewest deleterious sort of impacts on U.S. exporters and take into account the interests of allies and maintaining relationships with them. It's a, it's a tall order. And when, so they expand the remit of BIS hugely and look at the licensing numbers. BIS is processing far more license applications. It's only one metric, right? Far more than they were several years ago. Whereas DDTC, it's like something like a quarter of yep. what it was um, 10 years ago. Yep. And then secondly, BIS is then taking what seems to be their sort of characteristic approach. And this isn't a criticism, um, but where they are deliberate, right? They um, are very happy to rewrite regulations and add a subparagraph and a sub sub I don't know what's below a subparagraph, but um, <laughs> you know, down a couple of levels uh, and be very particular about it. Again, they say, you know, I think that, and actually in one of their recent rules, they said something like, you know, we're trying to use a scalpel uh, rather than a, a sledgehammer. And I think that's absolutely true. And that's how they how they tend to approach things over there whenever they can. They're very, I think, um, careful and precise whenever they can be about how they write the regulations. Uh, but here's the problem with that. Uh, not to go too far with this metaphor, but to use a scalpel, right? And you need to have, um, if you're a neurosurgeon, you have to have about 20 years of training, right? Before you really know how to use that scalpel and you're going to be in charge of that surgery. A sledgehammer, nothing to take away anything from the guy. Don't want to take away from the guys who, who use sledgehammers, right? But yep. um, it's a lot of work, right? It's, um, you know, it gets the, it gets the job done, uh, but it, it doesn't require as much training to do it. And I think the problem increasingly with the EAR is even for people who spend a lot of time on this, a lot of time looking at the regs, are familiar with the context and where to look, um, it, their BIS is being asked to do so much and to do it in a very particular way that doesn't have maybe um, too, much collateral, too much collateral damage. 
that's led to a case where the rules in many respects, um, starting with export control reform, and I think continuing into some of the recent rules with like semiconductors and related manufacturing equipment for China, I think is a good, really good example of it. The rules have gotten so complicated that it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people who actually have to deal with this day to day in exporters, I think, to understand it um, and and apply it. And I, I'm not sure that that impact is fully appreciated yet. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the last things that you mentioned, I think, are really important. I, I mean, all of that was very important. But I think the last part I wanted to focus in on, because uh, essentially, you know, not only is BIS now tasked with regulating more items because of the migration from the USML, but for, I think, reasons that have come from, you know, U.S. foreign policy and, and kind of the integration between sanctions and export controls, BIS is now being asked to deal with items that aren't even made in the United States. So they're, they're not U.S. origin. And so you've got these nine foreign direct product rules that are essentially designed to catch items by the EAR and make them subject to BIS jurisdiction, even though they're produced overseas. Because for foreign policy reasons, we've decided that the the EAR doesn't regulate enough stuff that we need to capture more stuff yeah. because because otherwise the controls of the EAR you know in view of BIS are being subverted and so so you know i think that's a lot of what's going on with some of these new export controls that apply to china and the new export controls that apply to russia they're both sanctions like and designed to catch capture things that are made outside the US so that you you can't circumvent the rules and that just makes BIS's job and the the job of anybody who's trying to figure out what's subject to the EAR just much much harder. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um and those those rules have really expanded and they've also become um more more challenging to apply because they're not just based on the destination, they're in some cases based upon where the item is located yep. abroad um, and uh, getting all the information that you need to make those decisions, even if you understand the rules, uh, being able to apply them in practice requires loads of information about how you make things, how you source components, the values of those things, um, what technology is used to make your manufacturing equipment uh, and you know, good luck uh, gathering, gathering all of that so you can determine whether the rules even apply to what you do or not. Yep. Well, I think that's going to be the last word. So where are we going to see you next at ECTI, Scott, or anywhere in the world? Anything that's coming up that you want to talk about? Um, yeah. I mean, we're, we've got a good schedule of, you know, public seminars in the U.S. and overseas coming up in 20, you know, in 2024. Um, so people who um, think this this is really interesting or they just need to do it for their job, more likely, uh, you know, uh, are welcome to come uh, come visit us um, and we'll have, you know, loads of time, uh, not just, you know, uh, an hour or so to to discuss it with you. So, yeah. So um, that'll yeah, be the we'll be last word. Yeah. yeah. Come come see us somewhere out in the world and we can have more fascinating discussions like this for, for hours on end. Um, so for those of you who, who want more, this has just whetted the appetite. Um, come see Scott at one of the ECTI trainings and he and I will be in, in the UAE coming up at the beginning of the year. So maybe come see us then. But with that, um, I'll thank you, Scott, for, for joining us today. My pleasure. And um, Stay sanctions free, everybody. Thanks for listening. Produced by Heartcast Media.